All right, so um, welcome to week four of our uh, engineering basics workshop seminars, lectures, classes, insert word that means me teaching people here. Um, so uh, we are pretty much done with sort of our basics, the basic statics. Um, I don't want to call it a unit, but um, the the statics basics uh, block of information. Um, and we're going to start talking about real things. So rather than just some random body that we assume is rigid, um, we're going to now start talking about how we deal with things that aren't rigid um, and how we actually talk about using uh, about starting to do more of that engineering design rather than just um, just uh, learning some better ways to talk about physics. So today, oh, uh, there we go. Um, today we'll be talking about uh, stress, the well, definition and different types of stress, strain and displacement, um, the kind of the differences between those two things. Uh, we'll talk about axial members. Um, in this circumstance, axial just means one direction. Um, so typically, uh, like if you were to take C204 as a class, you talk about axial members like, um, like a column or something as if it were actually on an axis. Um, while that works potentially better for, um, for like civil engineering, um, for mechanical engineering, it makes sense to talk about axial members just as something that the forces that you're analyzing only act in one direction. Um, uh, so later on, um, actually, in several weeks, um, we'll start talking about other types of um, other types of loading. So torsional loading, um, combined loading, bending, that kind of thing. Today we're going to keep it simple. Um, we'll start talking about cut free body diagrams. Um, so whereas before we talked about freeing the body from whatever your situation is, now we're going to cut the body uh, in convenient places and analyze what's actually happening on the inside. Um, and then we'll, after all that, uh, I don't know if we'll have time to get here today, um, but sort of the the big takeaway from C204 is this right here, the isotropic linear elastic model. Um, this is like the, the backbone of almost all of the engineering um, at least all of the analytical engineering that we'll do. Um, and most of your classes from now on will use a model like this. All right, so first thing, we'll start off. What is stress? Um, and there are multiple definitions of stress. In this case, we're not talking about the kind of stress that you experience during midterm season or during finals. Um, we're talking about stress on a, uh, in a local area. Um, so engineering stress is defined as force per unit area. Um, so it's the amount of force acting on a little square of area. Um, in the metric system, you say per square meter. In the English system, you say per square inch. Um, some of the more astute of you would say a force per unit area. Now, isn't that just a pressure? Um, and kind of, but no. Um, the, diff the big difference between a pressure and a stress is pressure is something that we're applying. Um, pressure is something that acts either, in a, if you're in a fluid, it acts um, within the fluid. If you have rigid bodies um, or bodies like we're going to be analyzing, it acts on the outside. Um, stress is a reaction. Um, so you can't, you can't have something on its own just experience stress, right? Um, these aren't college freshmen. Uh, in, uh, when you have 
something in the model that we're talking about. While the units are the same, while it's still a force acting on a unit area, um, the ideas are definitely separated. Uh, there are some analogs, so you can definitely see that um, if I have a force acting over a larger area, then the stress is going to be lower, right? Because you're dividing by a bigger thing. Or if I have a larger force over the same area, then the stress will be bigger. Um, like those, those mathematical concepts still apply. Um, but one big thing to, to uh, I would say, I would advise against trying to think of stress as a pressure. Um, I know when I took C204, uh, I saw, oh, P over A, that's pressure, that's easy. Um, and I kind of thought about it as pressure, um, which makes sense in the context of normal stress. But once you start talking about other types, it, uh, the, it quickly falls apart. Um, so let's dive into that. Um, there are two major types of stress. Um, stress that is normal, or what we see here. Normal means it's the, the force is acting normal to some plane on your body. So um, if we take this, this body right here, um, we have a force like in this diagram going in this direction. At any point in the body, if you were to take a cross section, you look at it in cross section, and you look at that plane, um, and I'll kind of try and draw this uh, obliquely, sort of isometric, like we see here. Um, the um, the stress that you'll see acts in the same direction as the force that you're applying. So um, this is called normal because that force is normal to your cut plane. Um, You'll, you'll start to get more familiar with cut planes, um, especially when we start talking about cut free body diagrams. Um, and as we dive further into this topic, it'll make more sense. Um, but usually in, uh, at least with our method of analyzing stresses and strains, um, whenever we make a cut, we're talking about, um, we're talking about making a cut that is perpendicular to the applied force um, that we're talking about. Um, if you have a body that has a force in, in this direction and a force in this direction, um, then we'll, we'll basically analyze it twice. Um, so we do one cut perpendicular to this force, or orthogonal would be the better term because it's, it's a plane, so it's perpendicular in two directions. Um, so basically we have to do everything twice. Uh, so we'll do, we'll analyze it first uh, um, compared to this force, and then again compared to this force um, in different directions. And obviously in three dimensions, we have three different directions that our forces can be in. So that's normal force. Uh, if you were to look inside of this body, your normal force would look like a pressure. Um, has pretty much all the same characteristics. You've got a surface here and a force being applied to that surface. And then we're talking about how it gets distributed over the whole surface. Um, that is about where the end of that, that is about where that comparison ends. Um, Cause now we're gonna talk about shear force. So shear force is uh, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting phenomenon to try and wrap your head around. Um, but essentially you can think of a shear force as acting in the same direction in whatever this cut plane is. So rather than, rather than acting away, rather than trying to pull something apart, um, you're actually trying to shear it apart. You're trying to rip it. Um, in this, in this scenario, if our, um, let's say that our body Let's see, we'll keep that the same color. Let's say that our body was actually this tall um, and we, we sort of made our cut there. Um, uh, whenever we're analyzing this, um, this shear force, we're talking, about, uh, we're talking about the material basically ripping apart rather than pulling apart. Um, 
Now, in when you when you speak of a normal force, uh, the words tension and compression are things that make sense. So, uh, a lot of times when I'm trying to figure out if something is a shear force or a normal force, I'm trying to see are the um, in this the the overall scope of my situation uh, is the body that I'm analyzing being impacted from two sides or just from one side. So for this example, um, the idea here is that there's some rigid, uh, we can either say it's some rigid fixture here, um, or it's uh, also okay to say there's an equal and opposite force acting in the other direction. Uh, and from statics, you know, you could say that if we have that uh, that rigid body or that that um, uh, rigid fixture, that the reaction force would be the same. It would be equal and opposite. Um, so when you're talking about normal forces, the idea is you have you have some somewhere in your situation two things acting equal and opposite to each other, and you're either trying to pull your material apart or you're trying to push it together. That's tension versus compression. In shear. Um, if we were to, to draw this same thing in shear, um, I might have a, a rigid wall. Um, we'll draw our, our, uh, our standard rectangle of science. Um, and our shear force acts in this direction. Now, we know that there's a reaction force um, from statics. We know that there has to be a reaction here. Um, but uh, while this is a rigid body, if you were to, uh, if you were to, I don't know, have a, a pipe hanging out of your wall and you were to hang on the end of this pipe, you know that it's going to behave very differently than if you were standing on top of a block, right? You're going to start seeing this bend. Um, you're going to start seeing it bend, or if you weigh too much, it'll actually shear off. Um, so it'll you'll basically have a plane here where it fractures um, and the this whole section of the body separates from this other section of the body um uh when we um if you've ever taken uh what is it mate 210 or mate 215 um you you kind of talk about the uh, ways to analyze um ways to analyze fractures and ways to look at them and try and figure out what type of stress or what type of forces caused that failure. Um, it's called failure, failure analysis. Um, in failure analysis, you look for some characteristic signs of, okay, does it look more like um, we have a flat plane here and this whole chunk just fell off? Or does it look like we stretched them? Uh, we stretched them out or pushed them together. Um, if you push things together, um, I don't know. Take a, a piece of play-doh, right? If you push it together, it's going to start to smush out. You'll start to get wrinkles on it. Um, or if you pull it apart, you'll see what's called necking. Well, actually, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, you'll see necking, where uh, it'll it'll try and pull the material in as it gets longer. Um, so those are the, the two fundamentally different types of stresses, are normal and shear. Um, normal, you think of as the same direction, um, or normal to the plane that you're analyzing. Shear is in the plane that you're analyzing, or acting, uh, acting somewhere that's unsupported. It's not in the same line of action as the reaction force. So then, of course, there are lots of different ways to create forces to create um, stresses that look like these two, um, right? If you're twisting something, uh, if I've got my my pretend twist cube here, um, if I'm twisting this, then uh, I would expect if I twisted it far enough that it would shear. Um, it would in one plane in one place here it would separate. So uh, that's one way you can think of torsion as creating shear stresses. 
whenever you're twisting something, it's not trying to pull apart, um, but it is shearing. Um, it, it'd be as if you were, uh, as if you were like pushing your hands together and trying to, to move them together. And you can, you can feel the friction forces between your hands. That is sort of what shear feels like if you're, if you're thinking about that or sliding. Um, if you're talking at a microscopic level, you're sliding or I guess nanoscopic level, um, the, the molecules within your material are sliding a, across each other. Um, whereas in normal forces, they're either pulling a, apart from each other or they're trying to push into each other. Um, hold on, let me make sure that that went back. Uh, there we go. Um, now, uh, there we go. Um, now you can also combine them so that torsion creates pure shear. Um, that's that's one way that where you just see shear stresses. Combined loading, so something like bending, um, can result in multiple different kinds of stress. When you bend something, um, and this is quite uh, complicated, this is definitely the end of your 204 class, but when you're talking about bending, you're both stretching something, right? If I, if I bend my fingers, um, it's both gonna stretch my skin in one direction, and it's also going to start creating shear stresses if it's not uh, if it's not supported properly. Um, don't worry about trying to understand that for now. We'll get to it later in much more detail. So that is stress. Now we have to talk about what is strain. Um, strain is a, a topic that is um, strain is a topic that. A lot of people kind of have some idea of what it is, but not really a good definition. Um, and actually, I think I'll hold that off. Uh, obviously, not this type of strain, um, right? In our case, uh, higher strains or more strains will lead to increased stresses rather than decreased stresses. Um, but we'll we'll get back to that in a sec. I actually have some examples here. So on our car. One of the simplest, like most dead simple ideas for normal, something that causes normal stress is in a cable. You think of this as in a pulley, in a rope, any sort of cable system. Um, cables and ropes are things that only act in tension. So I've got a throttle cable here. Uh, I don't know, we got a pedal there and another little lever, lever here on the engine, right? You push the, you push the pedal forward, we'll, we'll show motion in red. Push the pedal forward, pulls the, um, the governor or the, the throttle lever on the engine, which increases the amount of air that goes into the engine, which leads to higher RPM. Um, but within the cable, there is tension. And because there's tension, we start to see normal forces or normal the normal forces and normal stresses develop. Um, if I were to cut this cable, so we're gonna start analyzing the different planes in this cable and redraw it down here. Um, I'm gonna redraw this in three different sections. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll a little bit later get into um, cut free body diagrams and formalize this a little bit. But uh, just thinking about it like this, right? If you were to just isolate this system, so the system on this side of our cut, and you're to try and analyze this, let's say it's now a statics problem. You've got one force acting in one direction, and somehow we need to make this thing not move. So we freed the body, we have an applied force, now we need to make sure that we have a reaction. So we draw a reaction force here. Um, and one of the reasons this makes sense to talk about is it's all, um, it's all in one direction. So in whatever direction the cable's pointing is the same direction as our reaction force. Um, so we've got our applied force from the pedal, our reaction force on this side. And those two forces acting in uh, acting opposite each other 
you can imagine, are going to pull that cable taut, right? If you pull on two sides of a cable, it'll tighten up. So now that we've said what the reaction force is here, now we can look at this center section, the one that we're really interested in, right? We're, we'll say this is the section that we're actually analyzing. Um, so now you see, okay, we said there's a reaction force here. Um, so if I have a, a, this reaction floor force, you can now think of it as an applied force. Um, and in any situation, so across any boundary, right, according to Newton's third law, you're going to have to have an equal and opposite um, every reaction, or in the, we'll, we'll call this our new action, will have an equal and opposite reaction. So now we can draw the reaction in this direction equal, uh, I mean, I didn't draw that equal length, but pretend the, the magnitudes are equal, we'll call it F. Uh, actually, we'll call it T, T for tension. Um, so these two forces are going to be equal. Um, that follows. Uh, if we go through here again, right, we had another cut plane here. That means we need another reaction force here, which we can see also acts equal and opposite and with the same magnitude. So now just that section that we were talking about, um, we can see that there are normal stresses, right? There's stresses across the cross section. Um, so we'll, we'll just assume our throttle cable is circular. Um, this is circular, it's got some area, and then we've got a, a long cable here. Um, so now we've got this tension force. We're looking at, we're looking, uh, I'll say we're looking at this, um, this surface here. So right where we cut it, um, the, this would be in that plane. So we've got this tension force T pulling this way, normal to that plane. This plane has this area, we'll just call it A for now. Um, so our normal force, which we usually represent by a sigma, um, let me draw this better. We usually represent normal force by a sigma. Um, as you see on the previous slide, sigma equals P over A. P is just your applied force. So sigma equals T, and we'll keep colors because colors are nice, T over, uh, what is it, blue? T over A. Okay, so now we can analyze what are the normal stresses in our throttle cable. All we have to know is the diameter of the cable and how hard we pushed on it or pulled on it. Um, now here's an example of shear stress. Um, and this is one we'll actually, we'll get into later. Um, so on our car, there's a bunch, we have a bunch of tabs, a bunch of tabs that has bolts going through them. We'll just draw this tab, looks like that. Got a circle. Oh, and my laptop is dying. That's okay. Um, and then we've got a bolt. We'll just say it's a approximately hexagonal head bolt. Ooh, that's a that's not a friendly hexagon. Let's let's make it out of straight lines. Um, we've got a bolt that sticks through that point in the tab. So if we were to look at this in another view, right, you'd have the tab, it's really thin, and then bolt, we've got a head here, and then the bolt body goes like that. Um, and then typically you'll have something else, uh, I don't know, we'll call it, uh, uh, sure, we'll, we'll call it the, um, the seatbelt buckle um, acting here. Um, yeah, that's a, approximately a seatbelt buckle. Um, so uh, now that we have kind of a, a couple views of our situation, we want to figure out 
um, we want to figure out how this bolt is being loaded. And in that, we want to be able to choose what size bolt we're using. Um, so, uh, did someone have a question? No? Okay. Um, so on this, on this bolt, right, if we were to isolate the body, we can see that we've got a force coming from one direction from the seat belt. We'll call this the seat belt, seat belt buckle. Um, and we've got a, um, some reaction here that we assume is a rigid body. Um, so remember, we're, we're trying to analyze the bolt itself right now. Um, so we can redraw that rigid body as a fixture. Um, so we'll, we'll draw this as the fixture that uh, basically this area with uh, multiple lines here. And we know that um, since we have one force acting here, the location of our reaction has to be at this fixture. Um, and we know that it has to act in the opposite direction of the shear, or in the opposite direction of this, uh, of our applied force, right? If you go back to statics, you always have to, your, your reactions, your applied forces, and your reaction forces always have to add up. So now we have, um, now we have a couple forces acting in our direction. We have a free body diagram for our bolt. We want to figure out, well, bolts are rated for a certain amount of stress. Um, well, in the, I'll, I'll get into some numbers later on about the, the, the ratings of our seatbelt bolts. Um, but if you, if you were to imagine taking this bolt, right, if you pull hard enough here, um, you would predict that it would kind of shear in a plane right there. You, right, you'd, you'd see it break. Um, this would fly off. I know when uh, when we were doing, what was it? Uh, when we were doing testing of the steering effort, right? We had that that little quarter twenty or is a 1032 on there, um, and it turns out our drivers can turn with enough force that they kept shearing those 1032s. Um, so we would expect to see some shear forces develop in that plane. Now, similarly to to exactly how we did it before. Um, I'll call this my axial direction um, because uh, in a bolt, right, you have an axis. That, that's something that makes sense to call axial. Um, so we'll call this my axial direction. I'm just going to call it x for now. Um, and I'll take this cut in this plane where we expect to see the failure. Um, so I now have... Keeping, we'll make sure to keep colors the same. I now have this section of my bolt and another section of my bolt, and I made a cut right here. Um, and now I want to look at this surface. I want to look at this plane to figure out how much shear force I'm applying over that area. So on a bolt, your area, your cross-sectional area looks roughly circular. Um, technically, there's actually a little, a little chunk here if it's threaded. We'll just approximate it as a circle for now. Um, but you can think about it the same way. So we have this area. Now, the force that we're considering acts, uh, it acts perpendicular, or not perpendicular, it acts in the same direction or in a direction of this plane. Right, it acts in this direction, um, and our shear force tau. We can calculate the same way. So, usually, when you're talking about shear forces, if we go back here, um, you label a shear force as V. Um, this is just a, a conventional thing. Um, I'm going to call my shear force Q. So. We'll say this is equal to the magnitude of my force, Q, divided by my cross-sectional area, A. Um, the 
the reason that you don't see any normal forces here, you might say, okay, well, what if I, what if I made my normal direction this way, right? What if I made it line up with Q? Well, if you look at the bolt right where Q is, if we zoom in right where Q is, um, I'll redraw it here. Um, oh, I guess real quick, did everyone, did every, does it make sense how I transferred this force here? Um, I did the, the same thing that we did with the cable. So that my applied force was out here on the bolt. Then I said, I've got a reaction. Um, and because we have another cut over here, this, I know this has to be opposite. So I, I kind of rushed through that. I didn't make that explicit. Were there, were there any questions on that? Um, I'll give you guys a second. No? Okay, good. Um, so we'll, we'll look at, at this part of the bolt now. And I'll, I'll try and explain why we don't see any normal stresses. So if we, you know, I'll just duplicate this page. Give us a little more room to work with. Duplicate that here. Um, so on my on my bolt here, um, I've got this applied stress. Um, and remember, now we're just looking at the the little section right under, uh, or we're, we're looking at this other section that we cut off. Or right now, we're still trying to analyze what happens in this plane. Um, and one of the, one of the convenient things, oh, that's why, one of the convenient things about this analysis is this plane that we cut in, these two planes, this plane here and this plane here are still exactly the same plane. Um, typically by convention, we like to talk about this plane, um, because then all the directions and the, uh, all the directions that we're thinking of and all of our coordinate systems are still lined up. We don't have to kind of correct and rotate things around. Um, but functionally and in reality, these two planes are exactly the same. It's just the lens at which we're looking is opposite. Um, so on this diagram, I can talk about this plane here exactly the same as I can talk about this one. They're both just this plane that we sort of cut out and are now thinking about. Okay, so now why in this plane are there no normal forces? So it doesn't matter, actually, in this plane, we could get as close as we want to the force here. In fact, we could even be right on it. And there's never something acting in the other direction. Um, there's never a reaction that is in the same line of action. So there's never a, re a, a reaction that's entirely in the same line of action as our applied force, right? This was Q. Um, our reaction is always offset somehow. Um, and even on our, even in our diagram, right? Let's say that we have the tab here, and our seatbelt is touching it, right? So there's just this tiny, tiny sliver right here. We'll we'll assume it's zero, right? They're touching. Um, no matter how close we get these two things together, the center of that applied force Q is always going to be some distance away. And in theory, you can even say it's a differential difference away, which just means a teeny, teeny, tiny, immeasurably small distance. But it's still separated by that teeny, tiny distance. Um, so our reaction and our applied force are never acting in the same place. That's where your shear comes from. Um, so in this bolt, when we're talking about that shear, um, we're talking about this this plane, even if they were touching, um, we still have to think about this as acting in the same plane rather than acting um, normal to it. Um, you probably noticed these 
uh, these two bullet points here, double shear and single shear. So what are the difference between those? This isn't something that's terribly important. This is uh, at least for the analysis, for understanding the concept of shear. Um, but whenever you have a some body, oh, I don't want to use yellow. Whenever you have some body, if you're pulling on it from one side, we call that single shear. So we're pulling with Q here. So all the diagrams so far that I've drawn are single shear. Um, we got our bolt holding these two things together. Or uh, I guess if it's if it doesn't have a head, then it's a pin. Um, we'll make it a bolt for consistency's sake. Um, so this is single shear because there's only one plane in here, right? There's only one plane that separates the two. Double shear just means we also have something on the other side. So for the seatbelt tabs, uh, for the seatbelt tabs, um, these are actually in double shear because um, we actually have on the on the chassis. There's actually two tabs in here, and then we put the seat belt in between, right? About like that. And then we stick a stick a bolt through all three. This is double shear. So now you have two planes that the things act in. Um, one of the cool things about double shear, and one of the reasons that it's so much stronger, is that now your applied force, that we'll say is the driver I don't know, lifting up on the seat, your applied force is now spread out evenly between these two different places where it reacts. So now your, uh, your applied force, if this was Q, your reaction forces are now halved. So this is now Q over 2 and Q over 2. Um, for something like this, where it's, um, where it's, we have really um, basic, like comparably thin plates um, that this bolt is acting around, we don't have to worry about any more complicated, um, any more complicated analysis. Like we don't have to worry about bending. Again, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, but we can essentially assume these things are touching. Everything acts in straight lines. Um, one of the one of the big big assumptions with our shear model and with the engineering shear model is that our boundary conditions don't matter. We're, we're trying to simplify the problem a little bit more so it makes it easier to understand and easier to predict, right? The whole idea behind science, um, really science as a whole, is we want to be able to predict what will happen based on the laws of nature. Um, you can get philosoph as philosophical as you want about that, but at the end of the day, um, the boundary conditions, so the little bit of interaction here, right, if I, if I spread this out over this plane, those boundary conditions are so negligible compared to the, the big area here that's being, um, that's being acted upon that we usually just ignore them. Um, so for double shear, at the end of the day, to simplify it down, single shear, you have... You only have one shear plane or something on one side. Double shear, you have two shear planes. Um, there are, I mean, you could have as many as you wanted, right? You could have yet another, I mean, we could, if we went overkill, right, we could put a third tab on here. And we could say that the seat belt, I don't know, has this little protrusion on it. Um, and yeah, technically that would be... Um, that might be triple shear or quadruple shear. But at that point, um, it's starting to get into a much more specialized scenario. So there just aren't colloquial names for it. Okay, so now that we've thoroughly exhausted the concept of shear, well, not thoroughly, there's more, trust me. Um, but now that we have kind of a basic understanding of what shear stress is, um, we'll talk about strain. For those of you that don't know what these are, good for you. <laughs> You're innocent. Um, so what, and what is... what if we do know what they are? <laughs> uh, then you're part of Baja, and we like dirt and beer. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what is strain? Strain 
in the engineering sense is a change in length relative to the total length. Um, and again, you might be saying, wait, isn't that just displacement? And the answer is yes, but no. Like similar, similar to, um, similar to pressure as compared to normal stress, right? It's not a displacement. It is a displacement compared to a total. Um, so no matter what your object is, it could be this simple rectangular bar. It could be some circle that then becomes a bigger circle, right? We take some measurement, something we can quantify, and we say, okay, before it was this dimension, and afterwards it's this dimension. And that change, so it's the, the change, the delta, or if you, if you see here, delta, divided by the original, so this would be L naught or diameter naught, in this in this image you have length zero and then the final length is length zero plus delta that is what we define as strain um, displacement is delta in this in this scenario so displacement is okay how much did your material actually change right this distance here is Delta. Um, a lot of times we we use the variable u for displacement. Um, it's just a variable name. So the displacement here is the actual change in the dimension. The strain is the change in the dimension divided by the original dimension. Um, this will start to become more abstract when we talk about different types of strain. Um, for as as is typical in the axial case so what we're looking at here in one dimension it's easy to see right that thing strains uh, we've got a little bit that it displaces we measure the change that tells us our strain if you have some weird complex pressure vessel that um, experiences pressure from the inside and pressure from the outside and then you've got I don't know, some supports here. Now, if we were to just say, okay, I measure it one way, I measure one dimension before, and I measure the same dimension after, let's say it grows a little bit. Now, there's lots of different dimensions in here you can measure, and what the hell do we measure? Um, strain is this effect. It, the, the idea is it's this effect locally. So technically, it is equivalent to dividing this change over the whole length. But in reality, um, we're, we're looking at all of these things differentially. So we go back to that idea of cutting it. So if we were to cut it right here, if we were to take just a plane, strain is the idea of thickening that plane. So for every single plane in here, every single teeny, teeny, tiny little uh, uh, sliver, as small as we can make it, how much did that increase in size? Um, so for some complicated geometry like this, where you've got lots of different weird things, you're not saying how much did the whole thing change in size compared to its original size. You're saying, okay, for this teeny, tiny little portion, um, Sometimes, well, a lot of times it's called a differential cube. Um, those of you that are in 204 right now, I'm sure you've gotten accustomed to seeing this. Um, but for this little cube, how much did it shrink and grow in all of the dimensions that we can measure? Um, like I said before, we're talking axially. So... Currently, we're only talking about this dimension. How much did it shrink and grow in that dimension? But when we get to more complex, more complicated problems, we're saying, okay, in all three dimensions, how did this shrink and grow? Um, one, uh, one thing to, th to remember, or one, one thing that's sort of convenient for us, is there isn't an analog for uh, shear strain. Um, you can talk about it. We will 
talk about shear strain in uh, as an abstract sense, but really strain is always, it's more of the concrete thing that's actually going on. Um, you can never directly measure stress. You can never, um, you can never, there's no such thing as a stress sensor. Whenever you're measuring stress, whenever you're trying to figure out what stress is, you have to use other information to, to determine it. Um, you have to know, you have to know beforehand what your cross-sectional area is. Uh, you have to, uh, you have to then measure your, something like your force, um, and then you would calculate it that way. Strain is something we can actually directly measure. Um, there are fancy things called strain gauges. Um, that we probably should use more on our team, but we don't because they're kind of weird. They're hard to set up. They're expensive. Um, but strain is something that is totally possible to directly measure. This is an actual physical phenomenon, not just some, not just some concept that we use to, to talk about what's going on. Um, in the same sense that in reality, a force, right, is not an actual phenomenon you can calculate what a force is you can measure a mass something has mass you can measure an acceleration right something is actually increasing uh, every second its distance farther away from something or it's increasing its velocity every second um, but it's not an actual thing right um, if that didn't make sense don't worry about it <laughs> not important to understanding what it is. Um, but for those of you that are more concrete thinkers, more concrete learners, strain is your is going to be your your best friend. Um, so now there are lots of different directions that we can strain in. There's the axial direction that we were just talking about. There's angular strain. So if you're twisting something, right? If we had that steering wheel, and we're trying to measure steering effort, you've got one end of this steering, of the steering column. So I'll extrapolate this out to a steering column. Oh boy. Um, you've got one end of that st steering column fixed, and then we're trying to twist the other end. Um, inside here, right? If we were to cut this, now we're, we're twisting. Oh boy, we are twisting here, right? This isn't moving in, uh, it's not going to change directions in this dimension, but along the circle, right? If you had some line that was here, it'll rotate a little bit uh, in, due to the torsion, right? It'll move a little bit that way. Um, and that'll change an angle. So that'd be angular strain. It'd be like if we drew, if on this, on our steering column, we drew in a straight line we, with Sharpie, um, we would see that straight line start to twist and it would, it would start to look like a helix. Right, if I've got my sponge, um, I've got my sponge here, and I start to twist it, um, it'll start to look uh, if I drew like a straight or, or just use one of these edges, right, as a straight line, that straight line now changes angle relative to how we started. Uh, let's see. So sorry, Todd, I think you were breaking up a little bit. I don't know if everybody else was breaking up as well, but I didn't really catch that. Just like your sponge simulation. Is that true for everyone? Someone else. Okay, I, I'll just uh, I'll just show it again. Yeah. Okay, so we've got. Uh, oh boy, gotta work in mirror image land. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. So. So in uh in this sense, right, the angular strain, we've got a straight line here. And a straight line here, and if I put this in torsion, if I start to twist it that angle now 
looks different. So it's no longer horizontal. Oh man, this is really weird to do in, in a mirror. So that's roughly horizontal. If I twist it, now that whole line, or what used to be a line, is at a different angle than it started out. So that's, uh, that's angular strain. Can you run that line like anywhere throughout the like body, or does it have to be like on the bottom? Yeah. So, uh, so if you're if you're talking about torsion, um, this both happens in the plane, uh, and there's actually in in the lecture in in Hall's lecture notes, there's a, a pretty decent diagram of it. Um, I'll I'll I'm planning on talking about torsion in depth a little bit, little bit later on, so I'll, I'll I'll try and explain it more thoroughly. But if you've got this, um, we'll make a new, a new page here. This is our, our section, our section plane. Um, if you're twisting something, so we, we start out here. This is where we started. And we have a straight line that's also drawn here. So when we start twisting this, um, in uh, when you're straining something, so this side we assume stays in place. So this is the fixed side. So this point here, uh, or the the angle on this other plane. So I'll draw the other plane here. This stays the same. So that'll stay just like that. Then when we twist it, so when we apply a torque here, um, it'll twist so it'll actually rotate this surface so now afterwards our surface has rotated and I'll, I'll do this one in blue uh, I'm use black yet so after the after image we rotated our surface to here that causes this line to kind of form like that um, so if you if you can kind of think about this abstractly right We've got an angle here, just call this theta. We've got some other angle here, call it phi. Those are our two favorite angle names. Um, and you can just do some trigonometry, right? We know that this stayed fixed, and we said that this moved. So now what did, if we drew this straight line in marker, it now looks like this straight line. So this is our, our marker before, this is our marker after. Um, and same here, our, what was our green line, exact same thing, all we did was move the material. It now looks like it's here. You think, think of it like a, like a, a spring, right? If you, if you have a spring, just a, just a good old spring like this, you compress the spring. Right. If I were to draw, um, I don't know, let's say I were to draw a line, like a diagonal line on the spring, right? As I compress it, this dimension stays the same. This dimension shrinks. So overall, what was that line turns into that line, right? Because these stay the same. Um, that's one way you can think of as an a difference in angular strain. Um, now, typically for a spring, we're not going to we're not we're not going to put our plane here because that means anytime we talk about different forces, um, we're going to have to do lots of trigonometry. Usually with a spring, we'll just put our 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 analysis plane either here or here to make things easy to talk about. In torsion, we're just saying. This was our analysis plane, and relative to our analysis plane, our body rotated. Wait, question. So is there any real difference between angular strain and uh, angle of displacement? Or like, yeah, I think it's like, it's uh, represented as phi in class. Displacement um, angle or something. So the, the difference between your angular strain and your displacement angle is talking about theta versus phi. So theta would be our our displacement, right? Um, okay. We we took this whole rod and we displaced it by an angle of theta. Um, okay. So that's um P L over G J, right? Yeah, that would be um, 
uh, yeah, TL over GJ is what, what yeah. you're thinking about. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, this, this angle is... Uh, and this is this is part of the reason I, I wanted to get on to torque later on, uh, just because transferring between angles and and lines uh, is kind of different. Um, but you could also mm-hmm. you could also talk about this as if it were the length of this triangle here. Um, so you start out with a length. Uh, if it's if it's differential, right? You have a length that's teeny tiny. It's almost zero. Not quite zero, but almost zero. We'll say approximately zero. After you twist, now this line has some dimension. So now this line is of dimension D, right? Um, so the amount that we displaced, our displacement, um, if we sum up, uh, if we, we extrapolate that, we say, okay, this line is actually on a... Uh, rotated. So if we take the length of whatever that line was before, which we're saying is a lot of things that were approximately zero, now we have a lot of things that are approximately d. So that's going to sum up to, um, I'm going to call this zero plus. So that's going to be equal to zero plus plus d. Uh, sorry, d equals zero plus plus delta. Right, because it started as zero plus, ended as d. So delta, this is our displacement. D is our final length. So in uh, in angular terms, this would be l. This zero plus is l naught, and our delta here is displacement. If we were to reorder this, we say strain equals delta over l naught, or strain in this case would be equal to delta over d. Um, so it's equal to the amount that this changed compared to the final amount. And again, it, if, you're, if you look at this as if it were a bunch of little lines drawn on that circumference, um, and you're adding up all of the changes of those little lines, um, then you can kind of see how talking about an, a displacement angle turns into the same thing as talking about a displacement distance. Um, and then then talking about this as an angular strain starts to make some more sense. Did I clear up your question at least at least a little bit, Ernesto? Yeah, definitely. I think um, I think we're going to continue that topic specifically a little later on. Cool. Yeah, but, and we'll yeah, certainly good. <laughs> we'll certainly get to it later on. Um, For so sure. let's see. We're actually we're getting close to an hour now. Um, so I'll try and finish up the the strain topic here, um, and we'll we'll move on to the the other more exciting stuff later on. Um, let's see. How many slides did I have for that? Um, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll leave that for now. Okay, so then in the plane, <laughs> so this is where we start to get into uh, the invisible land. So axial or angular strains, um, changes in angle or changes in length, um, those are... Uh, those are both things that we can kind of concretely think about. Planar strains are uh, are something where you start to see uh, you start to see a phenomenon called necking. So planar strains or transverse strains are what happen when you have you have a bunch of material here. Um, we have a, a diameter here. Um, and all of this material, as we pull this direction, um, it'll start to try and pull material in from the sides because um, we're not destroying material here, right? We're just sh- altering how it's shaped. Um, whenever, whenever you're talking about stresses and strains, 
you're never removing material. The material's always there. Um, you're just changing the way that it's shaped. Um, so this guy Poisson, uh, he's he's the one that at least uh, coined this relationship. Um, is that whenever you pull something apart, the 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 cross section that you have, um, and typically we draw these as circular cross sections. That cross section will shrink. Um, so our cross, our larger cross section before, this is uh, this is the diameter is d naught or d before, starts to shrink, and it uh, it'll go down to our diameter after. So this is d final. Um, and we can think of this as a strain, right? Because we have an initial, some initial measurement, some final measurement, and some change in between. Um, so we can think of this as a planar strain. Um, in, in a broad sense, you know, although we're stretching it, typically this dimension, right, the, the change in length here, so this is after... Um, and this one is before. That is what we would call. Um, that's what we call. Oh, that's the strain of our of our test piece, wh whatever this is. Um, but at a at a microscopic level, and once you start to get um, once you start to get closer to to a material's fail failure point, um, it you start to actually see it. Um, your whole material actually shrinks in this other direction too, in the, the transverse direction. Um, transverse, uh, maybe from physics two, you 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 heard transverse waves. Um, so longitudinal versus transverse, same thing. Except now we're talking normal versus transverse. Transverse is just in a direction perpendicular to the one that we called the main direction. Um, the reason that it's written negative here, uh, the reason that we typically talk about as being negative, is um, when you pull something, so when you apply a positive force uh, in the y direction here, you see a negative displacement in the x direction. Um, so that's why a lot of times Poisson's ratio is written as negative compared to the actual strain. Um, and this is just an this is entirely a linear relationship. Uh, Poisson's ratio, this number, is empirically determined. So this is this is a number that comes out of whatever material we are currently measuring um, or analyzing or talking about. It's just the ratio. Um, it's just directly. It's a ratio of the amount of strain that we see in the main direction or the direction that we're applying the force in compared to the orthogonal direction. Um, transverse strain is always present, but it's often so, so small that we don't actually, uh, we don't actually have uh, gauges that are sensitive enough to measure it. Um, a lot of times we, uh, a lot of times we say that we can't measure strain until it gets up to 2% of uh, uh or sorry 0 0.02 percent of the initial length or uh, we usually say we can't measure strain until it's up to 0 0.02 which would be a change in length of two percent um or a change in length of 0 0.02 percent sorry <laughs> um so typically these are really small um Poisson's ratio is typically a, a much smaller number. So I think for um, I think for steel it's something like 0 0.003. Um, for some things like Play-Doh, it'll be much bigger, right? For Play-Doh, when, when you stretch it out, you can see it uh, shrink down really quickly. Um, yeah, usually that's not something that we worry about, but it's important to note exists. Um, and we'll, uh, I guess, next week, we'll see um, where that comes into play. Um, the last thing I want to talk about today, I know this is getting long, um, but I think this is a, a very important takeaway, is this whole model, this whole stress-strain model, treats 
materials as if they're springs. Um, our model, and I was trying to get to tease out the, the definition of the, the isotropic linear elastic model, but isotropic, isotropic, um, uh, I guess not isotropic, um, our model assumes that the material behaves the same way in all directions, and we assume that it behaves linearly, this is where the linear in that definition comes from, um, it behaves on a straight line in, uh, in, all, in all ways. Um, so if you look at the, the equation for stress, stress equals force or P over area. You can, you can see that there's a linear relationship here. If you increase the force by 10, or by a factor of 10, you'll increase the stress by a factor of 10. That's a linear relationship. If I plot um, stress here and force here, if I increase the force, the stress will increase linearly. Um, and we treat every, uh, whenever we use this, whenever we use the linear elastic model, the isotropic linear elastic model, um, which is what we're talking about here, uh, we are saying that this is the behavior we expect to see. Um, when we no longer see this behavior, uh, we start to talk about nonlinear elastic models. Um, that's when, if, you, if you've heard about yield strength, the yield point is the point where this no longer applies. Um, that's something I'll save for next week. Um, but for now, you can think of any time we are analyzing a body, uh, we're talking about it as if it were a spring or uh, as if it were a bunch of molecules held together all to each other by little springs. So these are all held next to each other by little springs. Um, and typically we would say we've got one atom here, one atom here, they've got some uh, electrostatic repulsion forces. And that is very, very well modeled by just a spring. Um, and in, in everything that we've been talking about, it's a spring in one dimension, so axially. Um, but later on, we, now, we th see springs in all three directions, connecting to the other molecules that are next to it. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're getting low on time, so I'll save that here. Um, just to re-cover what we've talked about today, um, we went over the different types of stress. Um, we, we gave it a definition and some of the different types. We talked about strain versus displacement. Um, and we started to talk about axial members and cut free body diagrams. Um, but you can see a lot of this information is all interdependent. So we have to, we have to kind of talk about it all at once before we can really build up to this last thing, which is our big goal, this isotropic linear elastic model. Um, so hopefully next week we'll take a lot of what we talked about today, combine it all together, and we'll come up with a, a really good solid definition for this model. Um, and either next week or the week after, we'll start to work with it. We'll start to do some examples of how we can use this model to predict how something is going to deform based on the amount of stress that, or the amount of force that we apply to it and its shape.